Hello friends, Happy New Year, my name is Hannah and welcome to my December wrap up. These are all of the books that I read in the last month of 2023 and I was just going to skip a December wrap up this year and get straight into like talking about annual stuff but then I felt a bit bad for the books that I'd read in December and thought that they deserved their own moment rather than getting lumped into um, a general wrap up. So Welcome. I'm going to start with three books that I read for a vlog where I was reading authors that I couldn't believe I hadn't got to yet. You know sometimes there's authors that you'll just mention in conversation, oh I haven't read anything by them and people are like, what do you mean you haven't read read that person. Not because um, they're a canonical author necessarily, just because they're the sort of author that based on your reading you should have read, kind of like if you're familiar with Books Unbound podcast, a mashed potato author. And there were three authors, um, well there's actually more than three authors, but there were three that I tackled in that vlog um, that I wanted to get to, to just finally read because I was pretty sure I was going to like their work. So I'll link the full vlog down below um, if you want to know more about any of these books. Um, but spoiler, I just really like them all. Um, I started with Patricia Highsmith. So this is Deep Water by Patricia Highsmith. Um, I was tempted to go for one of her most famous ones, like The Talented Mr. Ripley or um, Carol, but I went for Deep Water and I'm really glad I did because I didn't have any expectations really about the plot. <coughs> but this follows, um, this follows a man called Vic, who is married to uh, a woman who is having a series of increasingly unsubtle trysts with other men. And Vic is getting more and more bothered by this, not really because of the betrayal or because he feels particularly strongly about his wife, but more because of people knowing about it. Um, he feels sort of cuckolded. Um, and so he gets increasingly frustrated and decides one time at a dinner party to lie to one of uh, her current partners um, and imply, in fact, straight up say, that he was responsible for the death of one of her previous beaux. So that that actually happened in the book. Um, a former person that his wife had had an affair with did turn up dead and no one knew who'd killed him. And so Vic decides to tell this guy, scare him off by basically being like, yeah, I killed him. And it's a bit like, are you, if you're familiar with that theatrical, um, like, it's not even a theatrical technique. I can't remember who said it, but essentially like if there's a gun on stage in a theater show, at some point that gun has to go off. And Vic saying that he was responsible for the death of one of his wife's lovers is the proverbial gun. And what I loved about this was that there, was not, there wasn't really like a whodunit element to it. You know what Vic is responsible for in later portions of the book but it really feels like Patricia I. Smith is trying to um, really st stretch the morals of, of the reader um, because Vic goes on to do some really not okay things and yet he does sort of retain some sympathy. He's, uh, he's a complex man, it's a complex situation and I just thought it was really, really great. But like I said, um, you can watch the vlog if you want more uh, more thoughts than that, but liked it, it was good. And then the second book that I read, if I do that, they're gonna fall, aren't they? Go that way around. Um, the second book I read in that vlog uh, was Tipping the Velvet by Sarah Waters. Sarah Waters is like such a beloved uh, author of um, historical fiction, um, particularly queer historical fiction. And this was her debut novel, Tipping the Velvet. And it follows the life of uh, a girl called Nan, Nancy, um, from being a oyster girl in Kent, uh, becoming very enamoured with a masher called Kitty, which is essentially like a Victorian drag king. 
Um, and then Nan goes on to become a masher and then there's many other episodes in her life where she has various different roles and becomes embroiled in different parts of the sort of uh, seedier side of Victoria London, let's say. But I absolutely love this. I think if you are interested in queer history, um, definitely, uh, definitely check it out. It, I do think you could tell that it was a debut novel. There were um, some parts in the structure that I felt could have been um, tighter. I think Nan was um, not always, she was sometimes quite a dismissive protagonist of, of other people uh, in the book, which was a little bit, um, I would have liked, uh, I would have liked her to feel a little more sympathetic sometimes. Um, but yeah, it, it was great. There's uh, really good uh, spicy scenes in this too. Um, but yeah, if you're looking for sapphic history, here you are. Um, and the final book that I read, um, this is like a, a small but mighty book. This is Ghost Wall by Sarah Moss. Um, I haven't yet, even though we're into January now, I haven't yet officially looked at what my best books of the year will be, but I think this one might be on it. This book does so much damage in such a short amount of time. This is um, about a 17 year old girl called Sylvie who is on holiday in Northumberland with her family. Her dad is a amateur historian and he's very, very interested in kind of Bronze Age Britain. Um, in a kind of brexit -y way, he's very, um, he's very taken with this idea that there were original Britons, like pre-Roman Britons, pre-people from overseas Britons. Um, and so his family have kind of wangled their way into um, this archaeological dig that's going on, or not, e not even an archaeological dig, that's not right, like um, a immersive archaeological experience in Northumberland um, that a professor is running with some of his like postgrad students where they're trying to get a feel for how Bronze Age people would live. Um, you realise very early on that Sylvie's father is a very problematic man with very problematic views and who does very problematic things. He is abusive towards his daughter and his wife and it's really, uh, it's like watching a car crash in slow motion, this book. It's very good and very horrible. It just slowly keeps like turning the tension up and up and up. It's, it's also just really, it's really impressive that in such a small space of time, Sarah Moss is exploring so much about um, heritage and class and migration and belonging and sort of, even though there's quite a small group of characters, also looking at kind of group think and how that can have disastrous consequences. And it was brilliant. I read it in one sitting, it was fantastic. So that was, the, they were the three that I read in the vlog. I read a couple of audiobooks next um, and I've sort of got like a low key, long-term reading ambition to read all of the shortlisted Booker Prize books from my lifetime. So just every so often I have a delve into the Booker backlists and I got an audiobook out from the library of The True History of the Kelly Gang by Peter Carey, which won the Booker Prize in 2001. Um, and this is, oh, it was narrated by Gianfranco Negroponte. This is a book about uh, the Kelly gang. So Ned Kelly, if you're familiar, was a um, bandit criminal um, in kind of uh, Australian history. He was um, of Irish extraction, um, but uh, sort of born and raised in 
Australia. And um, the book is essentially uh, Ned Kelly, an imagined version of Ned Kelly's telling of his own life. And it's written, um, addressed to a daughter that Peter Carey invents. I don't think Ned Kelly actually had a daughter. Um, so he does play, for a word that's got true in the title, he is playing fast and loose with what true is. But um, yeah, so it's it's told uh, as if Ned is explaining to his daughter what, how he became Ned Kelly and had the reputation that he had and so it's told in like I think 13 different parts um, and at the start of every section it's there's sort of a little statement that is explaining um, the condition of the pages that have been found so it's as if Ned has written this manuscript for his daughter that maybe never got to her um, but has been discovered and is being uh, and is being kind of catalogued and, and recorded um, which was a really interesting way of um, kind of framing each section because uh, it starts with a brief description of the plot for that section, which kind of reminds me of like older books, like um, I feel like some Dickens books do this, where there's almost like a little strap line under the chapter title that tells you what's going to happen in the chapter. Um, and you get that in this. So it was an interesting kind of like uh, callback. And um, I didn't pick up on this because I listened to the audiobook. Um, but I was talking to a friend of mine about it after I read it. And she told me that apparently the book doesn't really have any um, commas in it. Um, and it's like the punctuation is very sparse, um, presumably because... Uh, Ned didn't maybe have sort of uh, a, didn't really have much of a formal education and so wouldn't necessarily have been like au fait with all the grammar rules of like commas etc and also apparently it links really closely like the style is very similar to the only piece of writing that we know Ned Kelly actually wrote which was called the Gerildery letter um and so Peter Carey's obviously kind of looked at that construction and and really tried to emulate that in his own writing, despite the fact that a, I think a, a good chunk of what he's written is fabricated. He's kind of tried to keep an authentic style to it. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, and I couldn't tell from the audio performance that, that the narrator didn't necessarily have many clues as to the phrasing of things. So I guess that's kudos to Jim Franco because I, I didn't um I didn't notice that, although he wasn't very good at doing an Irish accent, I will say. Um but yeah I I I liked it. It was it was um it was really really interesting and I can I can see why it won the Booker. So yeah if you're looking for a, a kind of historical piece of historical fiction, I don't think I've ever really read any historical fiction that is set in Australia. So that was interesting. Um, and yeah, recommend. The next book that I read was The Singer's Gun by Emily St. John Mandel. And I, again, listened to this on audio. It was narrated by Morgan Hallett. Um, so I have like a weird, a weird rebellious streak when it comes to Emily St. John Mandel. And like, I, I haven't read Station Eleven. And for some reason, I don't know why, I really don't want to read it, even though <laughs> I think I probably would like it. But so for whatever reason, I'm like reading around Station Eleven because I do like her writing style. I don't know why I'm not reading that book. It's just, it's, it's a brain thing and I, I won't, I'll get there, I'll get there. Um, but I have previously read The Glass Hotel by her and really, really liked it. I didn't like this one as much, but it was quite similar. So if you enjoyed The Glass Hotel, you would probably enjoy The Singer's Gun. Um, if you um, you haven't read Emily St. John Mandel before, she's very, very adept at having a really diverse, um, multiple POV sort of narrative styles where there's lots of different things going on and then she weaves it all together and you kind of have to wait to the... The, the conclusion of the book to work out how everything fits in together. But this book is ostensibly about um, 
a man who goes missing. We know at the start of the book that a man has disappeared. It becomes, um, we suspect early on that he had something, he was doing something illegal, um, something to do with faking passports and potentially with trafficking people into the United States. And he has disappeared. And so you're getting his perspectives from prior to his disappearance. Um, you're getting the detective's perspective. You're getting, I think, sometimes the perspectives of his um, cousin, who he was in business with, and also from his former client slash current assistant slash sort of lover. Um, and it all kind of comes together uh into this quite complicated narrative. And I think what Emily St. John Mandel is really good at doing is um, having kind of a really engaging kind of mystery running through the heart of the book, but because of where the characters are coming from and how they connect with each other is able to grapple with some kind of big global societal issues. So in this case, we were looking a lot at class, we were looking a lot at migration, we were looking a lot at, um, employment and fair employment um and yeah it was really it was really interesting it lost me quite significantly towards the end which is why I said I didn't I didn't like it as much as the glass hotel but I did I did think it was an interesting engaging kind of mystery so there's that the next book I read I also got um out from the library I got the ebook of Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. Um this is one of those books that a bit like with Station 11 has been like people have been so obsessed with this book this year that it made me a little bit reluctant to pick it up. Um and I I had some some very close friends who absolutely adored this book. And you know when like people that you really love, love a thing and you don't want to realize that you don't love a thing because you want to love the same thing as the people that you love. Um, but I ended up really enjoying this good, this book. So it was fine, it was fine. Um, yeah, so this, what the thing I was reluctant about with this book is this is a book that a large part of this is about gaming and game development. And I am not much of a gamer at all. Um, but weirdly, the gaming stuff ended up being one of the things that I enjoyed the most about this book. So you never can tell with books, can you? But um, this is really a story that's about um, the friendship between two people, Sadie and Sam. They meet when they're quite young uh, in a hospital. Sam is there because he has been having reconstructive surgery on his foot um, because it got really badly crashed, uh, crushed in a car accident and um Sadie is there because her sister is really unwell um so Sam's sort of in hospital but Sadie is just kind of there hanging out because it's where her sister and her parents are and they bond over playing games um in a kind of like games room in the hospital and the book follows their friendship but the timeline is um is quite uh, fragmented. So sometimes you jump forward in time into where they are now, and then you'll jump back to like when they were kids. But essentially they they end up um, coming back together when they're in their twenties and designing a game together that ends up kind of being quite influential. And then it's about their creative collaboration. It's about their sort of friendship. Um, it's about the fact that they really, really love each other, but also they think really badly of each other quite a lot. Um, and there's this constant tension between wanting to trust them, wanting to trust each other, but also feeling like the other person is capable of really brutal stuff. Um, and yeah, I think if you're, it was really nice to read a book about, a, that was just really exploring friendship and I really, I really liked that. There is a thing that happens in this book towards the end that made me throw my e-reader onto the floor. And I was so upset that this thing happened. Um, not like upset, just, just, I didn't see it coming. I wasn't ready for it. And I'm still mad about it. 
but yeah so just just you know that's coming for you don't rest on your laurels just because you think you're getting near the end just saying um but yeah i thought i thought it was it's not going to be my, like one of my favorite books but i really really enjoyed it it was a really engaging read like very well written and like i said all of the parts where they were having these very creative conversations about gaming um was really interesting because i don't know why i hadn't twigged that essentially um writing a really immersive great game is is about storytelling I, I probably didn't need, I, I shouldn't have needed to be told that, but there we go. And then the last fiction book that I'm going to talk about in this section, I couldn't resist. I was going to wait and borrow my friend's copy, but I I bought volume five of Heartstopper. Um, I don't really like, even though I have an e-reader, I, I really struggle with reading comics on a screen. I don't, I don't enjoy it. So I hadn't, even though the whole of Heartstopper is available online, I hadn't read any of this, um, any of this part of the story before. And yeah, this picks up um, with Nick and Charlie. Nick is kind of working out where he might want to go to university and the implications of what that might mean for uh, his relationship with Charlie and whether or not Charlie is well enough to um, cope with Nick maybe not being around as much. Maybe is, does Nick want to leave? Charlie, um, does he want to stay local? And yeah, it's just, I love these boys. It is charming. Um, I, re I think the thing that I really like about Alice Oseman is that she is able to, we've got this incredibly sweet, incredibly supportive, and in lots of ways quite idealised relationship between these two boys, Nick and Charlie. And yet, even while she's doing that, she's not ignoring lots of, real issues that happen um like mental health like anxiety like consent and actually i think it's great the way she talks about consent in this and about uh how nick and charlie are navigating that in their relationship and i think that's really really great to see for any kids and particularly for for queer kids so yay yay heart stuffer lovely okay so um i'm gonna do we're going to move on to talk about some non-fiction now and I'm going to start with a book that I really really enjoyed. This was Sex Robots and Vegan Meat Adventures at the Frontier of Birth, Food, Sex and Death. They may be in the another order but um, <laughs> that's what it is by Jenny Kleeman and this is sort of what it sounds like. Um, Jenny is a, a journalist and broadcaster and she does a deep dive into four different technologies that are each impacting on the human relationship with each of those things. So for birth, um, for example, she's looking at um, ectogenesis, so the ability of, te of technology to facilitate um, ex utero uh, pregnancies basically. So what if you could grow babies? outside of a human body um, and what that means in terms of being able to um, potentially save the lives of babies who are born prematurely, for example, um, what that means for um, inclusive parenting for queer couples, for example, um, but then also on the flip side, what that means for our relationship with bodies and with pregnancy and um the potential for that to be privatized the way for example some adoption services are in some countries and surrogacy services and things like that so what i really liked about this book is that she goes deep into where we currently are with technology so she goes to different organizations that are trying to develop different um aspects of this technology and then she looks at the kind of philosophical impact of that so if we did this what does that mean for us as humans and about our relationship with our own existence um really so that was birth then um sex was as the title suggests sex robots um ha what the various ethical dilemmas are with the use of sex robots or if there are how AI interacts with that um, whether or not there is a therapeutic benefit 
for them. Um, and it was so, so interesting. Death is all about um, euthanasia and different technologies for um, that, that companies are trying to develop for um, being able to create a pain-free, stress-free, empowering way for someone to end their own lives, but also, um, which I think I think a lot of people are on board with the idea of, of euthanasia um, for medical reasons, for example. Um, but she goes broader than that and looks and talks to people who have a kind of um, who see a, a wider need for access to uh, euthanasia. So that was really interesting. And then the final one, again in the title, um, food is vegan meat. Uh, and looking at the different organisations that are trying to produce vegan meat or a meat replacement. Um, and as a vegan, I found that really, really interesting. It was fascinating. I think I'm actually, I, I, I got the audio book out from the library, but I think um, I might actually buy a copy of this book because there was, there were so many little bits in it that are just really, really interesting that I might want to revisit. So yeah, I recommend that if you're looking for a kind of like, Louis Theroux-y, John Ronson-y, like, deep dive into um, different technologies and their uh, potential impacts, uh, I recommend. The next book I read was Divine Might by Natalie Haynes. So this is the follow-up to um, her book Pandora's Jar, which was looking at the history of different um, women in uh, classical mythology, Greek mythology particularly. Um, and this is all about gods and goddesses. And I'm going to preface this by saying, I love Natalie Haynes. I love Natalie Haynes. She's my favourite person that does myth retellings. Um, I didn't love this one as much as I liked Pandora's Jar. And I've been trying to work out why that might be. And I think it might be because, um, well, a few things. So in Pandora's Jar, it was really tracking like how the different um, female characters in myth have been changed and tweaked over time based on um, sort of what, how different societies perceived women or wanted to control the narrative around women. And because the goddesses have a higher degree of power than the normal women in myth, it felt to me like they just, that social tweaking of what the goddesses represented was a bit subtler. And therefore I was, I just wasn't as, I wasn't as um, surprised by any of it. But it also might be that I was just more familiar with some of the goddesses stories than I were some of the kind of mortal, mortal women. Um, but I mean, I do still think if you're, if you're interested in Greek myth, it's it's a great book. I might, um, you know, if I'm like doing my own little bits and pieces of writing, I think there'll be useful stuff to consider and go back to. Um, but I did find myself skimming a few bits. And then we're sticking with sort of uh, folklore traditions with Treasury of Folklore. Um, can you see that? Uh, Woodlands and Forests by Dee Dee Cheney and Willow Winsham. So I was, I, I can't fault this book for being what it is, but it wasn't quite what I wanted. So um, this is, as it sounds, a collection of different um, folklore um, and mythology from around the world that is linked in some way to forests. Um, and I can't fault the research that's clearly gone into um, sourcing these stories, but I think it the sections were all, on the whole, really, really short. And I think um, I would have preferred fewer examples explored in more depth um, because uh, I think I was having the, the issue that I often have with short story collections of like, I just wanted a bit more from each of them um, and they all kind of blended in a little bit. I also think they were obviously making an effort to be um, global in their outlook, but there were, it was very Eurocentric. Um, 
but still i think it's a useful uh and a useful kind of little compendium or like reference book it's a good coffee table book that you can pick up and and flick through um but yeah on the whole i didn't i didn't love it but i think i wanted it to be a different thing than it was so it is not their fault it just wasn't quite what i wanted <laughs> The next book I read, I picked up because um, one of my uh, goals this year was to read more Northeast authors. I, I live in the Northeast of England um, and I wanted to read and support local authors more. Actually, um, this little book bookshelf on the piano that you can see here, these are my Northeast authors. Um, and this is uh, one of the books that I picked up. This is 12 Moons, A Year Under a Shed Sky by Caro Giles. And it is a memoir. Uh, and so we follow, as you might, as you might guess from 12 Moons, this is following, um, a year of Caro's life in sort of the quite immediate aftermath of her marriage breaking down. Her family have moved up to Northumberland, um, and her and her husband have recently separated and she has four daughters, um, and it's during COVID the year that this is written. So there's just quite a lot of, quite a lot of st things going on. And each section is kind of split, it's split up by the moons. So essentially each chapter is a month in their, in their life. And I felt just a little bit missold by that framing because I, I was expecting it I was expecting the moons and what the various moons mean in kind of uh, folklore and, and, and mythology to have more of a bearing on the content that was being written about um, or the emphasis that, um, that Cara was putting into her writing, but it felt a little bit um, tenuous or a little bit like an afterthought. Um, she does, her and her daughter do, her daughters do clearly um, appreciate and value the moon. They will often like go out and like try and like look at the moon or like they're very aware as a family of the moon cycles and things like that. But it, it felt to me a little like, um, yeah, a little bit of a, of a gimmick um, that wasn't really like the substance of what the memoir was really about. It was more of like a framing device, which is fine, but I think the title almost sold it a little bit. Um, but I mean, I think it's, it's really, there were parts of it that I really liked. Her nature writing, um, I really like. There were like lots of bits about her and her daughters going wild swimming and walking up in the Northumberland countryside that I found um, really lovely but she has quite a lyrical way of writing that can feel quite um, distancing sometimes and like there were moments sometimes where I literally didn't couldn't understand what she was trying to communicate um, for example like an example is so her eldest daughter um, has some kind of she's had um, some health issues in the past she's got some kind of like chronic pain or fatigue condition. Um, and I completely understand why Cara Giles hasn't like disclosed what the condition is in the book, but also it's spoken about in this very metaphorical way where I'm like, I, do, I just, I'm really struggling to understand the challenges that you're trying to describe. Um, because I literally don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, so there were a few bits like that. Um, but yeah, so like bits and pieces that I liked in here, but I don't think I would be in a, a, a rush to read um, more from Caro Giles. I am glad I read it um, and, and gave it a go. And like I said, there were some pieces of nature writing in here that I liked, but there were <laughs> there were a few bits that I, I just found quite, um, quite distancing and... Um, we do have some differing personal opinions on education and schooling. I can see where she's coming from. Uh, she homeschools a number of her children, which is absolutely fine. But as someone who works in the education system, it always breaks my heart a little bit when people feel like they don't have a place in it. Um, but yeah.
that's that. And then sticking briefly with uh, the Northeast, this is kind of like a, b a bonus book um, because I, I wouldn't count it as a whole book because it's only tiny. Um, but my friend uh, Helen knew that um, I was wanting to read Northeast, more Northeast stuff. And she is an avid collector of zines. And um, this is one, actually she let me two of these. Um, they're the Northeast History Compendium um, volume zines. And this is volume one and volume two is up there still waiting to be read. Um, and these are just really short little um, excerpts of Northeast history. And I really liked the guy who started it, um, ba -ba -ba -ba, Kieran is he started it because he was really interested in local history, but he found that in lots of ways it was it was really inaccessible. It's quite hard to research local history sometimes. Um, access to archives isn't as open to the public often as it could or should be. Access to um, academic research and papers is often behind paywalls and just isn't always easy for people to to get to and so he set up a project the northeast heritage library to essentially crowdsource through the community as much information and sources about about the northeast as um as he could find and i think that was really laudable because he also recognized and i hadn't um ever thought this thought myself but when he says it in the introduction to the volume i i totally see what i totally see what he means um, in that in some in some spaces where people are very invested in local history, a bit like in in Ghost Wall, um, often some of those places can feel a little xenophobic, a little inward looking um, and a little closed off from outside influences that can put a lot of people off from engaging in the kind of exploration of local history so I just think like uh from a moral uh standpoint I really uh I really appreciate what Kieran is doing and I'm I'm looking forward to getting to the next volume I read a another memoir this month I read Maybe I Don't Belong Here by David Harewood and I really loved this book um so David Harewood I'm sure you'll be familiar but if you're not he's a um he's a British actor uh, who has had quite a lot of success overseas as well. He, I think one of his biggest roles was probably in Homeland, um, but he crops up all over the place. And um, uh, yeah, he's, he's an actor that I've, I've liked for a long time. Uh, but what I didn't know is that when he was in his 20s, he suffered from a um, period of psychosis and was uh, sectioned, he'd actually been sectioned twice under the Mental Health Act. Um, and he did a documentary, which I still haven't seen, but now want to go back and see. He did a documentary about that um, and trying to sort of revisiting what actually happened to him at that time where he was kind of reading through his medical records and, and things like that and trying to pull together a picture of what actually happened during that period where he was um, experiencing psychosis. And then... Um, so that was the documentary and the book he wrote after the documentary came out and is more looking at why that why that might have happened and his reflections on where what he talks about as being a sort of fracturing of his identity um, might have come from. And so it is a, a traditional memoir in lots of ways, but it's also very specifically framed through him trying to understand what about his relationship with his own identity may have led to this experience of psychosis because it's very it is um particularly common in black men in the uk um and so he is looking at these two identities of being black and british that shouldn't be in tension but feel like they are and his experience of them feels like an exhausting sort of holding intention of these two things that shouldn't feel opposite but often do feel opposite and it was absolutely 
fascinating. I really recommend the audiobook, partly because it's it's narrated by David Herbert, who's a lovely actor, um, but also um, there is a, a foreword by David Olshoga and a conversation with David Olshoga and David Howard at the end of the audiobook that I think is exclusive to the audiobook. Um, David Olshoga, if you're not familiar, is um, a historian. Um, he's actually from the northeast of England, bonus points. Um, and he, uh, he has done loads of documentaries, um, particularly on the BBC, but um, he did the documentary Black and British. Um, and that uh, there were lots of things that I remember from watching that documentary that were very relevant to to the book and they were talking about that. He also does my my personal favorite history show, which is A House Through Time, which if you, if you haven't watched A House Through Time, I really recommend it, it's excellent. Um, but yeah, so I recommend the audiobook for bonus extra David content. And come, we're, we're coming to the end, don't worry. Um, the end of December means the end of my year long read along of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. Um, so I have been doing, you may know, um, a chapter a day of War and Peace this year, which is a, a read along that Simon at Footnotes and Tangents on Instagram um, has been running. And can I just say what a brilliant leader of, a, of, of that read along Simon has been. The thought and attention and detail that he puts into his posts about the book are is like just absolutely second to none. He's a real champion of slow reading and really taking your time with a book. And what I've learned is I respect the hell out of that, but it doesn't work with my particular spicy brain. Um, I, I have read War and Peace before. Um, you may remember earlier this year, I was doing originally two chapter a day read-alongs. I was doing this and Les Miserables. Um, and I couldn't stick to the chapter a day for Les Mis because it was a book that I hadn't read before. And that there's something about the chapter a day slowness that actually I was finding, although I enjoyed doing it this time. Um, I feel like I had a better experience personally the first time I read War and Peace because I could get more swept up in it. And I, I understand on a logical level why going really slowly and doing a chapter a day and thinking really deeply about it um, would it enable you to have a deeper understanding of the text. What it became for me was a chore and a thing that I had to do every day that I just had to tick off. Um, and so actually I, I was not engaging with it as deeply. Um, and I think had, had Simon not been diligently keeping us on track, I would have well fallen off the wagon. But I did enjoy it. I do recommend, I know it's a chunk and I know a lot of people are intimidated by it, but I, I genuinely do think it's a great book. Don't get me wrong, there are some bits that we can skip. Um, but on the whole, I do, I do think it is a great story and I do recommend it. Um, and sticking with the rereads, very, very briefly, the final three books that I read of the year um, has become a bit of a Christmas tradition for me this year. Um, I reread uh, His Dark Materials trilogy. Um, I listened to them on audio this time round, um, which I kind of flip between doing uh, a hard copy, like a hard copy reread and an audio reread. Um, but yeah, this this year was the year of audio books. And I mean, I, I love these books. They were, they were some of the first books that I read that I felt really, um, fascinated by um that really stimulated my curiosity I think um they're still some of the best books that are written ostensibly for a young audience that really don't speak down to children and give them the due credit for being able to grapple with really difficult ideas but that still I can read as an adult and I constantly feel like I'm picking up on new stuff. Um, so that was an absolute delight to revisit those three books. Um, and yeah, that has been December and that has been 2023. So um, I'd love to know what books you read this month. Do you have any Christmas traditions with your reading where you, um, 
read certain books uh, at, the, at the festive period. I didn't read anything actually Christmassy, um, but I don't, I don't tend to. I tend to gravitate more towards specific genres <laughs> at the Christmassy time. Um, I like a bit of historical stuff around Christmas, but um, yeah, let me know what you've been reading. You will see me next with my end of the year wrap up. We're gonna do some fave books. We're gonna do some stats. We're gonna do some channel plans for the future. So I will see you there for that. And thank you very much and goodbye. Mwah.